and Zhang Wu. The main agenda on today's show is the ongoing public relations tug of war between North Korea and the US after a rather muted ASEAN regional forum last week. We also talk about the new UN guidelines re-allowing humanitarian aid to North Korea. Plus, the Iran sanctions are back, but they sent a wrong message to Pyongyang. All that later, but first we have the latest headlines with Devin Whiting at the News Center. Devin? Hi, jang -ho. In keeping with his promise to cut red tape, South Korean President Moon Jae-in took a first-hand look today at the country's financial technology or fintech industry. The president tried out the internet-only banking services that entered the market only a year ago. He said they need to be given room to grow and encouraged investment in that sector. He also noted that while they've brought new competition into the financial industry, regulation has made things difficult for them. The president urged lawmakers in parliament to work on deregulation too, saying they should support innovative growth in finance and new industries through legislation. The UN Security Council has adopted new guidelines to speed up aid deliveries to North Korea. The Security Council decided to act because its sanctions have had the unintended result of holding up shipments of food and medicine. Lee Seung Jae reports. The United Nations say around 10 million people in North Korea need food and other assistance, while about 20 percent of North Korean children are stunted due to malnutrition. While UN sanctions imposed on North Korea in response to its nuclear and ballistic missile programs exempt the delivery of humanitarian aid, the UN's humanitarian chief Mark Locott told UN members following his trip to North Korea last month that one effect of sanctions has been quite substantial delays in the procurement, shipping, and delivery of aid supplies. In response, the Netherlands, which chairs the Security Council Committee monitoring sanctions against North Korea, announced Monday that none of the 15 council members objected to new guidelines aimed at speeding up aid deliveries to the North. The guidelines recommend that governments and NGOs submit any requests for exemptions in a letter containing 10 specific elements. The elements range from providing detailed descriptions and quantities of the items to be imported, to naming all parties involved in the delivery of goods, and showing what measures ensure the aid is used for intended purposes and not diverted for prohibited purposes. The Sanctions Committee says it will try to process the exemption requests as quickly as possible to avoid any delays. With a population of about 25 million, North Korea faces chronic food shortages, as well as a dire lack of drugs and medical equipment. Despite the ongoing sanctions on the North, the new guidelines should bring new hope to those in need. The guidelines will now be sent to all 193 UN member states. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. And the heat wave on the Korean Peninsula has made the North's food and medicine situation even worse. A recent, recent report from the International Federation of Red Cross Societies says it's been officially informed by the North Korean Red Cross of emergencies in the southern provinces of Pyongan Namdo and Hamgyong Namdo provinces. The heat wave started in mid-July and the mercury has reached close to 40 degrees Celsius in certain parts of the country. The North Red Cross organization said the heat has significantly hurt agricultural production and many elderly people and children are suffering from heat stroke. With the heat wave expected to continue until mid-August, the International Red Cross says it aims to send water to the hardest hit areas and improve food security. Civic groups from South Korea, North Korea and Japan are forming a joint body to bring back from Japan the remains of Koreans forced to work under Japan's colonial rule in the early 1900s. Holding a press conference in Tokyo on Monday with North Korean and Japanese civic groups, South Korean members of the Korean Council for Reconciliation and Cooperation said the joint body will work to excavate the remains of Koreans buried in Japan's Yamaguchi Prefecture and on Okinawa Island. It will also repatriate two sets of North Koreans' remains. It's believed there are remains of nearly 3,000 Koreans in Japan. The U.S. is reimposing sanctions on Iran starting Tuesday following President Trump's pullout from the 2015 nuclear deal. The sanctions will start with cars and metals, but later this year they'll start to include oil, which could have a big effect on Korea. Cha sang -mi reports. The first round of the U.S. sanctions goes into effect on Tuesday following Washington's decision to withdraw from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the Iranian nuclear deal. The sanctions will cover Iranian trade in automobiles and metals, including gold. 
But even before the sanctions are fully imposed, Korea's outbound shipments to Iran are declining. The Korea International Trade Association estimates exports to Iran dropped by more than 15 percent during the first half of this year, from the same period last year to around 1.7 billion U.S. dollars. What's more worrisome for Korea is the second round of sanctions, which targets Iran's oil, energy and financial industries, that's scheduled to come into effect in November. The sanctions are expected to take the form of a secondary boycott that would apply to companies and countries trading with Iran. That means Iranian crude shipments is to drop by November and could prompt a price hike on local gasoline prices. Iranian crude currently takes up nearly 98 percent of all Iranian imports to Korea and more than 10 percent of all crude shipments imported into Korea. Local gasoline prices rose for the fifth straight week to trade at around $1.40 per liter on average, the highest level so far this year, according to the Korea National Oil Corporation. Already the amount of Iranian crude imports to Korea dwindled by 18.5 percent during the first half of this year from the same period last year to $3.3 billion. Cha Sang-mi, Arirang News. The unprecedented heat in Korea this summer has a lot of people worried about their power bills. It's been dangerously hot, in fact, so they've had no choice but to run the air conditioning. This afternoon, the government laid out a plan to reduce people's electricity expenses by adjusting the progressive billing rate for households. Kim ji has the latest. The Minister of Trade, Industry and Energy, Pei gun gyu announced plans Tuesday to ease the burden on households from electricity bills during this summer's heat wave by changing the billing system for July and August. The progressive billing rates will be revised so that the first two stages are each 100 kilowatt hours higher, meaning the lowest tier applies until usage hits 300 kilowatt hours, and the second tier goes until 500. For example, a household of four using 350 kilowatt hours of electricity in a month would only have to pay 58 U.S. dollars, down 25.5 percent from the current rate. On average, the ministry estimates that more than 15 million households will save 10,000 won, or around 9 U.S. dollars less a month when their bills arrive as soon as this week. Though the discount applies to every household in principle, for those whose bills for July have already come, the ministry says that they'll get the savings next month. In terms of how much extra the heat wave is going to cost people, the vast majority of households, 89 percent, are expected to see their bills rise by less than $9. That's based on analysis by the ministry of more than 4 million households. Those who are going to owe more than $44 extra are only 1 percent. The ministry also unveiled mid- to long-term plans to improve the current progressive tariff system by conducting test cases later this year and implementing the changes by 2021. It also says it'll expand discounts for nearly 3 million low-income families and households with babies to help them stay safe in the summer weather. Kim ji Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting, and those are your news headlines. Wrapping up his state visit to Singapore, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo revealed that his North Korean counterpart, Ri Yong-ho, restated the regime's clear commitment to denuclearize when they met at a forum over the weekend. But during the same event, Ri publicly criticized the Trump administration for not taking what he called constructive steps to build trust. Meanwhile, the U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton says it's North Korea that has not taken enough steps to denuclearize. There's a lot of who said what there, and we'll try to make more sense of where each side stands at this point with an expert in just a bit, right after this report by Kim hyo -sun. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says North Korean Foreign Minister Lee yong ho has made clear the regime's commitment to denuclearize. Returning home from his trip to Southeast Asia following the ASEAN Regional Forum, Pompeo told reporters that his North Korean counterpart should deliver on the commitments Pyongyang has made. Asked about the speech Lee gave in Singapore on Saturday, during which he called for a, quote, simultaneous and phased approach by both Washington and Pyongyang, Pompeo downplayed concerns by saying such a remark is in stark contrast with hatred expressed by the North during last year's forum. 
Although he failed to sit down one-on-one -on -one with his North Korean counterpart in Singapore, Pompeo stressed numerous times that lots of conversations are taking place between the two countries. Meanwhile, CNN reported Monday that North Korea believes there is a strong possibility of a second summit between its leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump. Citing an American government official, CNN explained that the recent exchange of letters between the two leaders is seen as a positive sign. The official was also quoted as saying the summit could happen before the end of the year. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. Now to help us break down the developments, we have Professor Kim jae Chun from Sogang University here with us today. Thank you for coming on the show, Professor. It's good to be here. So, as we've just heard, Pompeo told reporters that North Korea Foreign Minister Ri yong restated their commitment to fully denuclearize, but at the same time reissued a statement warning that North Korea will not act first unless the U.S. shows it's taking further actions to build trust. What do you make of these two contrasting statements and what should we listen to? Well, as you said earlier, I think the tug of war is, is taking place between the two countries uh, with regard to who will have to take the first step. Uh, I believe that North Korean regime certainly thinks that they have lived up to their part of the big you know, bargain after the uh, June 12th summit uh, by demolishing Punggyeri uh, nuclear uh, testing sites and also uh, uh, shutting down uh, testing sites for uh, ICBM and also returning remains of the war dead to the United States. But the U.S. certainly thinks that these measures aren't really good enough because these measures don't really address core issues of denuclearization. So the U.S. position is that we, you will really have to take meaningful steps toward denuclearization uh, unless those happen, you know, uh, the U.S. is not willing to uh, de-escalate sanctions and the U.S. is certainly not willing to declare an end to the Korean War. So there is a, a, a tug of war taking place with regard to who will have to uh, take the first step, uh, who will have to be uh, listened to first. I, I don't know. I mean, there, there's something that two countries will have to work on. Maybe uh, Moon Jae-in government will uh, have to uh, uh, play a, a more of a, a proactive diplomatic role here to, to mediate the differences between the two countries. Yes, play a brokerage essentially. The report just now also mentions a possible second summit between Kim and Trump before the end of the year. We don't know the source of these comments. They cite North Korean officials, but we don't really know at the moment. Mm. But do you think it really could happen? I mean, if you don't know the source of these comments, <laughs> it's all guesswork right now. Mm. I, I think uh, uh, North Korean chairman uh, Kim Jong-un is more than uh, eager to hold a second summit because mm. it's going to be a huge political victory on the part of North Korean regime. Uh, Mr. Trump uh, might be tempted to hold a second summit if he believes that uh, holding the second summit with uh, Chairman Kim uh, will work to his political advantage. But uh, without making a real progress toward denuclearization of North Korea, holding the second summit will become a huge political burden on the part of, of Mr. Trump. So I think it all, all depends on whether two countries will be making a real progress toward North Korea's denuclearization. I think it's pretty clear what, North, uh, what the U.S. wants from North Korea, the positive steps towards dismantling its nuclear uh, program. But from North Korea, they talk about further actions to build trust. What do you think those actions are? What, what are we looking at? What does the U.S. need to give uh, the North Korea at this point? Well, uh, North Korea, uh, the regime certainly warrants uh, the U.S. to uh, take a more of a proactive role here in declaring an end to the Korean War and to de-escalate the sanctions. Uh, those are, are, are gestures of goodwill toward North Korea. So North Korea is adamant about not uh, taking the first step toward denuclearization, such as presenting a, a report of existing nuclear arsenal and, and materials and facilities. So. Uh, yeah, uh, if, if the U.S. Uh, uh, takes a first step here and, and to uh, declare an end to the Korean War and to de-escalate uh, some portion of the sanctions, that will be taken as a, a gesture of a goodwill uh, toward North Korea. And that might uh, actually jumpstart uh, North Korean action towards real action toward denuclearization. But uh, we're not so sure about that yet. You mentioned the sanctions there. I mean, uh, since the ASEAN Regional Forum uh, over the weekend, North Korean state media has been quite adamant and quite vocal about their uh, criticisms of the sanctions, mm -hmm. and they've asked for them to be lifted. Mm. What do you make of North Korea's aggressive tone, and um, does it not risk antagonizing the U.S. here at this point? Well, they cert it, it certainly does take a risk of antagonizing the United States, but uh, if you give in too much uh, when your uh, you know, good uh, you know, gesture is not reciprocated by the U.S., 
uh, by uh, U.S. Uh, taking a first action to declare an end to the uh, Korean War and then de-escalate some of the, some portion of the sanctions, uh, the uh, North Korean public might, might think actually that, well, North Korean regime is giving in too much to the uh, Trump administration. I think that uh, can be one of the, uh, the reasons why the, the North Korean regime is, is, is adamant about not really taking the first step here. Right. What's interesting also about North Korea's criticisms uh, since the ASEAN Regional Forum was, in one of the news, uh, the state media news uh, um, pieces, while criticizing the US, um, US administration, it also revealed for the first time that Pyongyang had returned the remains of the mm -hmm. US soldiers mm -hmm. killed in the Korean War. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think this was a deliberate act by North Korea to release this kind of information on the news media? Because it hadn't done so so far. I think it's a way of putting pressure on the Trump administration. You know, uh, you know, we, we have done our share of work here. I mean, uh, since early this year, uh, North Korea has taken uh, great pains to uh, to improve economic situations by uh, opening up to the United States. Uh, to that extent, uh, you know, North Korea regime went uh, as far as to uh, return remains of the war there to the United States uh, uh, without any uh, compensation. So, but the, the economic situations aren't really improving in North Korea. So, mm. uh, you know, by releasing this information to to uh, North Korean public, uh, you have an excuse here. We have lived up to our part of a bargain here, but the U.S. isn't really uh, following up here. So it's all U.S. forts. So it's a way of. Uh, putting pressure on the United States and, and blaming the U.S. Uh, for, uh, you know, the uh, uh, economic uh, conditions that aren't really improving since uh, early this year. So despite the return of the remains and other um, uh, steps forward, right now it seems that the two sides, the U.S. and North Korea, are deadlocked at the moment. They're not making much progress. Mm -hmm. Which side do you think is more frustrated right now? I, I think both sides are, are <laughs> frustrated. But uh, I, I think uh, it's North Korea uh, who is, you know, which is under more of a pressure because, as I said earlier, uh, economic situations aren't really uh, improving. And there is a sign that uh, the U.S. is trying really hard to uh, strengthen the existing sanctions regime against North Korea, in which case North Korean economy might turn for the worse, uh, you know, take the turn for the worse. So uh, sure, U.S. is also under the pressure. I think President Trump and Trump administration is also under uh, uh, immense pressure uh, from the uh, news media and, and public opinion that is very critical of, of the uh, Trump administration's handling of North Korean uh, nuclear weapons situation. But uh, in, uh, all in all, uh, if you think about uh, economic uh, conditions that are uh, deteriorating in North Korea, I think North Korea is under more of a pressure here as long as we uh, you know, maintain these uh, sanctions regime intact. Mm. What's interesting right now is the Trump administration has also reimposed sanctions on Iran. Now, the situation with Iran and uh, North Korea related to the U.S. Mm. aren't exactly the same, but they do have some parallels. Mm. That's, what message do you think reimposing sanctions on Iran sends to North Korea? I don't think uh, uh, Trump administration is intentionally uh, impose, reimposing sanctions on North Korea to uh, impart a, a certain message to, to North Korea. Mm. I mean, uh, when the Trump administration to, uh, decided to pull out of uh, JCPOA, which is uh, Iranian nuclear deal, everybody pretty much expected that the sanctions uh, would return uh, after 90 days. So uh, I, I don't think uh, reimposing uh, sanctions on, on Iranian regime is, is, is to impart a certain message to, to North Korea. But that said, yes, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the Trump administration can certainly uh, uh, you know, say to the, to the North Korean regime that uh, we are uh, very much uh, eager to, uh, willing to hold on to a sanctions regime unless you take the first step. So, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, the, there was a, uh, uh, the, the intention was to uh, impart a message to the North Korean regime, uh, but there is a message that the North Korean regime can glean, uh, you know, lesson that North Korean regime can glean from uh, Trump administration's decision to reimpose the sanction on North, you know, on, on Iran, you know, uh, as long as you don't take, uh, uh, you know, action. We have no intention of, of lifting sanctions first. Mm, I know, but for North Korean point of, point of view, it's very much like how can we trust the, the U.S. when they've said they've made a deal, but they suddenly put out of it. With, to be honest, not a lot of uh, changes in the situation. Exactly, but uh, yes, so, so there is, as you said, there is a parallel between the two cases, but I, I think uh, 
uh, Iran and North Korean cases are fundamentally different because uh, in case of Iran, there was a legitimate deal uh, that was cut uh, like some five years ago, and then the uh, Trump administration backed away from this uh, legitimate deal. But in case of North Korea, there was no such a deal. And uh, it was possible of, for uh, North Korea to, uh, to walk out uh, voluntarily to uh, denuclearization negotiation table because uh, there was an agreement uh, between the international community as a whole, uh, you know, all these countries that uh, North Korea is, is going too much with these nuclear weapons programs and missiles. So there was uh, an ag agreement uh, shared, a consensus shared by the international community that we will have to impose sanctions on North Korea to bring North Korea to the uh, denuclearization talk. So there is a, a big difference between these two cases. Again, the timing of the sanctions in, on Iran is quite interesting as well because we heard that uh, North Korea's foreign minister, Ri Yong-ho, from Singapore was scheduled to go straight to Iran afterwards. Why do you think if, why the North Korea's foreign minister would now go to Iran at this point? I mean, well, is the, is to it certainly just to put some uh, pressure on uh, the Trump administration, uh, you know, we, we might actually uh, reinstore some of the, uh, you know, cooperation programs that they used to have uh, with the Iranian government uh, uh, years ago. But I, I don't think uh, uh, this uh, tactic will turn out to be effective. Uh, I don't think uh, Iran and, and North Korea uh, will be able to uh, present a unified front uh, against uh, uh, the United States, I, I, I don't think it's going to be able to elicit uh, a consensus or support from the international mm. community. So uh, it's, it's a way of, uh, uh, you know, sending a message to, to the United States that, you know, we, we can uh, restore some of the uh, cooperation programs between the two countries, but I don't think this is going to be effective and I don't think uh, uh, Trump administration will be uh, uh, scaling down uh, sanctions mm. because of the uh, the North Korean foreign minister's visit to, to Iran. Mm. So I think there's still some message there, I feel like, that they're playing almost... Uh, yeah, I mean, at least there is Kenya. something that we can do between yeah. the two countries. So, uh, mm. yeah. So from one diplomatic uh, um, trip to another, mm. South Korea's nuclear envoy went to China on Monday and they are said to have met, well, he's said to have met his Chinese counterpart mm. to talk about the uh, de declaration to end the Korean War. It seems like China is getting more and more involved in this process now. What do you make of that? Well, uh, I think China's position is very clear uh, with regard to this uh, progress of uh, declare, de you know, declaring an, an official end to the Korean War because they were a party to the ceasefire agreement after the Korean War. So they are saying that it is quite natural for China to be a part of this process of you know, declaring a, a formal end to the Korean War. but. Uh, Deep down, uh, you know, I, I think they, their intention is to uh, maintain or uh, initiatives uh, in Korean uh, Peninsula affairs mm. uh, th that have taken place. Maybe uh, trying to prevent uh, growing influence of of the U.S. Uh, in North Korea. So uh, yeah, as you said, I think it is uh, very clear uh, that the intention of uh, China's uh, China government is to. Uh, uh, you know, to get uh, more deeply involved in, in Korean Peninsula affairs so that they can maintain uh, these uh, policy initiatives uh, in, in the Korean Peninsula affairs. What do you make of the fact that, though, South Korea is making so much effort to try and get China involved in this as well? Because although China was one of the uh, signatories of the ceasefire, mm -hmm. essentially it's between the two Koreas and possibly North Korea and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Why do you think South Korea wants China involved so much as well. Well, initially, uh, Moon Jae-in government was 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 not really uh, eager to uh, get China involved in this process of uh, declaring a, a formal end to the Korean War. Mm. Uh, you know, Moon Jae-in government first initially thought that it, it can be done without uh, China's you know participation, you know, between the the U.S., North Korea, and South Korea, but. Uh, but China uh, made it very clear that they are a power to be reckoned with here uh, in Korean Peninsula Affairs and they're putting a lot of pressure on, on South Korean government here. And I think the South Korean government grew uh, more realistic that the sidelining uh, China at this moment is, 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 is uh, counterproductive here. And one of the fears is, is that China is, you know, isn't really enthusiastic about speeding up uh, North Korean nuclear denuclearization process here. So if you uh, get China involved in this process, uh, 
uh, maybe maybe the, the process of, of, of uh, denuclearization and the process of uh, building a peace regime uh, on the Korean Peninsula uh, might uh, be uh, delayed. I, I, I think that is the reason why the U.S. and, and, and the South Korean government are a little bit uh, wary uh, about growing uh, influence of China and, and, and China's uh, willingness to participate in this process of denuclearization and, and peace building uh, you know, regime on the Korean Peninsula. Interesting, but mm. I'm afraid we're out of time, Professor. But thank you for coming in and uh, think, sharing yeah, your thoughts with us today. It was my pleasure. Yeah. That's where we'll end it. Do tune in again tomorrow for more breakdowns and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you again for watching and goodbye for now. are coming home and we see today as tangible progress in our efforts to achieve peace on the Korean Peninsula but today is just the beginning